end time explosions of truth with Apostle Takim. It's been said, if you want to get married, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to get married, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if you want to be free from any work of the devil, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to be free from every work of the devil, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if things are not okay with you, it's your foundation that is responsible or some altars in your village. But God has sent his teaching prophet to tell us, if things are not okay with you, it is the foundation of the Lord that is missing in your life. The Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi presents Moment of Grace and Truth, the prophetic and apostolic teaching ministry of Richard E. S. Takim. We cannot stop screaming the rumblings of the Holy Ghost to the ears of our generation. Now, follow us to the sanctuary. Repair the breaches in my spirit. Activate my prayer life. And bring me to a point of getting results in prayer. I hope you are and pray. Lord, bring me to the point of getting results to be able to handle anything in prayer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Is everybody hearing me? Is everybody hearing me? People in the back, are you hearing me? Can I hear a response? Okay. Go open to the book of Luke chapter 18. Let's... Um, begin with that scripture. Luke 18 verse 1 Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Do you see it? He did not say Christians always ought to pray. He said men. That means mankind is designed to survive through prayer. You know when the creator is talking you have to listen to him. You get my point? He said, men always ought to pray. Men always. It's, it's, so, it's so funny that we don't know that Jesus did not come to start a religious move. He came to save mankind, whoever we, you are, to save every human being. So he said, men always ought to pray. He didn't say Christians. He said, men, a human being, you always ought to pray. So prayer is non-negotiable for you as a human being. That's what he's saying here. Prayer is not negotiable. It's something that must be a part and parcel of your life. He said, men always ought to pray and not to faint. So it means there should be no breach in our prayer lives. We that are born again, we should be able to actualize this scripture. Are you, understand, are you understanding me? We should be able to actualize this scripture. We that we are born, in, born again. So, so born again makes supposed to make it possible for us to actualize this scripture on daily basis. So if you, if you are not operating at this level where you, 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 your prayer life is smooth on daily basis, if you are not at this level, then you are not actualizing one of the major intentions of God for your life. Are you understanding me? So this very morning, I want to just step down a little and preach on operating in the prayer spirit in a perverse and crooked generation. Operating in the prayer spirit in a perverse and crooked generation. The prayer school we had in 2016, I spoke about moving from prayer book to the prayer spirit. And uh, I hope some of you, you need to get those CDs as I've been singing and asking for your own good because you need to get where we are coming from. Are you understanding me? Because there are, things I, there are things I said about the prayer spirit that I can't say now. Are you, are you understanding me? So I'm taking us further. I thank God those, that teaching was on a very simple level that uh, can help us. So, so, but in the church today, if you look at the prophetic gates into the prayer life of the present church, like the things we saw last week, apart from praying at the level of Baal and praying at the level of Babylon, you will see um, uh, people using prayer books to pray instead of prayer spirit. It is not in God's plan that you use a book to approach him. You understand me? Using a prayer book to pray is like 
your child wants to meet you and he hold a book like this and say, Mommy, 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 uh, I want to eat chapati. 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 Is that, is that not madness? You will bring the child for prayer. You say, This child is, is under attack. That's what we do in the spirit. When we recite those prayers, that those written stuff that people, some, then, some of us download from the internet and do all kinds of nonsense. So the, the church has been divorced from the prayer spirit. You cannot actualize Luke 18.1 if you don't operate in the prayer spirit. You cannot actualize it. What if you are thrown in the river? What if you are drowning? You are drowning. Can you carry a prayer book and pray? No. You have to pray. That's why I say men always ought to pray. In every situation or circumstances that we find ourselves, we have to pray. Do you understand me? So, 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 so that's why we're talking about operating in the prayer spirit, not the prayer book. Operating in the prayer spirit. And I said so much in the last school. I spoke about how the prayer book thing began in Nigeria. And I give details of the churches that started it and how the team filled the whole world in the prayer school of 2016. I think it was this hall we used when I preached that. So get those CDs are going to help you. And the, the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Don't deny yourself truth. Understand where this thing started. Thank God I was there when it started. I didn't know that God was showing me those things so that I can warn my generation. So that was, I knew how the prayer book started. It was not existing in Nigeria. It was not existing before. It never existed. We knew who started it and who they are. So I unmask it in, those, in, in that school, 2016 prayer school. I unmask it. So you get those things. We spoke about righteous prayer. We spoke about petitioning prayer. We spoke about identifying your prayer post in the spirit realm. We spoke about all those things. So you need it. So me, I'm building on that. And let's read the book of Acts chapter 2 and see what the Bible says about a crooked and perverse generation. Acts chapter 2. It is very difficult to actually operate in the prayer spirit in this generation. That's why we have to understand how to do it. Acts chapter 2 verse 40. Look at what it says. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them. This, this was Peter talking. Remember he was the first preacher after the earth pouring. He said, and with many other words, he testified and exhausted, uh, exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse, and what? From this perverse generation. Do you see? Be saved from this perverse. So you see the first thing Peter told, told us. After he preached Jesus and he, he spoke a lot of things, he now concluded by saying, be saved. So the essence of salvation is actually to run away from something. Be saved from this perverse and crooked generation. Be saved from this perverse generation. That's what he said. And the Bible says in verse 41, Then those who gladly receive his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And these souls that were added now continued step back, step back in their process doctrine. If they don't continue, they, are, they, they cannot be heaven worthy. But my point of reference is in his warning. And I want to read that scripture with the amplified version. Look at, look at what it says. It says, And Peter solemnly and earnestly witnessed, testified, and admonished, exhorted, with more continuous speaking and warned, reproved, advised, encouraged them, saying, Be safe from this crooked, perverse, wicked, unjust generation. You see the way preaching flow. Authentic preaching will reprove, will rebuke, will advise. It will encourage and the next thing it will do, it will warn you of the spiritual, uh, uh, the spiritual content of your generation. It will tell you of the kind of environment you find yourself and what to do in such environment. If you don't understand the principle of environment, you can just destroy yourself. Sometimes environment 
play a lot of role in the life of a person. It determines you're going. That's why some people, they leave from this place, get to this place and start succeeding. Some of you were in some churches, you came here and your Christianity changed. Environment. Environment. You get my point? Environment. So environment have changed. So, so that's why the apostolic we always wonders of the environment we find ourselves. Verse 16 now says, holding out to it. Sorry, verse 41. Therefore, those who accepted and welcome his message were baptized. So you have to accept the apostolic message for it to work in your life. So that's how we are, we are looking at the, the, we call it apostolic prayer school because that's how prayer began. Do you understand me? The apostolic prayer is cooked by the prayer spirit. It's not prayer books. Apostolic prayer is, is, a, is a product of the prayer spirit. It's a product of the prayer spirit, not prayer books. Are you understanding me? Let me read another scripture that spoke about that, this environment. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Let's open there. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Philippians chapter 2, verse 15. Look at what it says. Let me read from verse 14. 14 says, do all things. Philippians 2, 14. Do all things without complaining. Say, I hear. I hear. And disputing. Verse 15. That you may become what? Blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as light in the world. Can I hear a good amen here? Yeah. So God does not want the generation to submerge us. We are to shine his light. We are to do what? Shine. That is why we don't run away from the devil. We shine the light and he run away from us. We are to shine the light. It's just that if we don't have sufficient light to shine, God will take you away from the place and hide you somewhere so that they will not kill you. <laughs> but when you have, he will put you face to face with devils. Are you understanding me? So, but look at what it says in Amplified. It says from the, in verse 15 of Philippians 2. It says that you may show yourself to be blameless and guiltless, sorry, guileless, innocent, and uncontaminated children of God. Uncontaminated. Purity. Tell me purity. You see, see we, we, we have to be uncontaminated. We have to be pure. We have to be, we have to, we have to be saved from the pollutions in our environment. He said, he said the vision of God is that we will be uncontaminated children of God. Without, blame, without blemish, faultless, unrebukable. That means when God look at you, there's nothing to rebuke because you are okay. He said unrebukable. Do you know that God did not rebuke Jesus once? Because he was okay. When Jesus was on earth, he was a man. He was like you and you. In fact, he came to show us how Christianity ought to be. You get my point? So he, was, he took our place. He was like you and I. So, so he was so perfect that God found nothing to rebuke. God only blessed him. This is my beloved son. He will man well please. Job also, there was nothing for God to rebuke. He not told the devil, have you considered this guy? There's nothing in his life for me to rebuke. May we come to that realm in God. Where there's nothing for God to rebuke. We are all rebukable. But, but you have to be purified to come to that realm. You get my point? He now said, all rebukable in the midst of a crooked and wicked generation, spiritually pervert and perverse. So a crooked and wicked generation is a spiritually pervert and perverse generation. They don't do anything right. They want to get married. They marry anyhow. They want to go into a business anyhow. They don't do things right. The woman will only remember that, that she, have not, she didn't marry properly after 25 years. Maybe one problem comes. When there is peace, nothing. Do you understand me? It's a perverse and crooked generation. Things are just zero. So, so it's a generation that does not like doing things right. So now, how do, I cult, how do I operate the prayer spirit in such a generation that does not like doing things right? A generation that celebrates the wrong. A generation that gives trophies to wickedness. It gives trophies to wickedness and weaken the resolve of those that want to do things right. 
The Bible says, he that departed from evil made himself a prey. So because you say you are not going to walk in evil again, you, they began to torment you. Ordinarily, they should celebrate you. Ordinarily, people should applaud righteousness. But the generation will find herself, it's a generation that you tell them, leave prayer books, come to the prayer spirit, you are, you are a fanatic. They look for a name and give you. Do this right, don't do this way, well. they look for a name I give you. In our generation, we need strong mind to speak strong truth and stand in it because it's a wicked and perverse generation. So how do we operate a prayer spirit in this kind of generation? Where when you pray, they say you pray too much. When you don't pray, they say you are not praying. You get my point? You are living in a house. You pray too much. Then when, when, the devil, when you stop praying and the devil attack them, they will not say, ah, you say you're a Christian. So where are the prayers? But you are the one that stopped me. You get my point? They will not let you pray and they still want you to operate in power. How? So that's the kind of generation. It does not agree righteous things to take root and grow. People could take away your joy because you live right. Take away your marriage because you live right. Take away your money because you live right. Take away your, your honor because you live right. That's the kind of generation we find ourselves. It's a wicked and perverse generation. It's why those of you that are having husbands or wives that doesn't even want you to talk to God. How do you survive such an environment? You are right in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. Right there in your house. Some of us, we are blessed. We don't see it at home. We see it on the street. Or when we go to work. But some, it is we too. You wake up in the morning. It is standing there, generation. Wicked and perverse. Looking at you like this. How do you survive such a bear? How do you survive such a place? That is why we are here today. Do you understand what I'm talking about? These are the things that we want to share today. Because the Bible says in verse 16. Okay, let me read, let me complete this verse. It says, spiritually perverted and perverse, among whom you are seen as bright light, stars or beacons shining out clearly. Hallelujah. Shining out clearly in the dark world. Verse 16. Holding out to it and offering to all men the world of life. The world of life. So, so, so we, we must know how to survive in this kind of a generation. But I want to begin by showing you the first thing God will focus on in your life when you meet Jesus. The first thing God focuses on. Let's get put first things first. I've, I've told you why we are, we are having this session today is to teach us how to survive, how to operate the prayer spray in a wicked and perverse generation. So, so let's now see. Let's, let's begin the journey. What is the first thing God focusing on in our lives after we meet Jesus? After we accept Jesus? What's the first thing he focuses on? Let's, let's, let's talk some, some scriptures. And so let me just see... Luke chapter 15. Let's see Luke chapter 15. Let's, uh, the story of the prodigal son answer us. So that we, we are just our priority, right? Remember, we are in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation that does not want anything, prayer, in the right way to take root in your life. Do you, do you, do you understand me? So, so, so what is the first thing God focuses on? Look at Luke chapter 15. We have a responsibility to keep the prayer fire, my friend. No matter where we live or what we are facing. Luke 15. Are we all there? Look at the prodigal son when he came back to the father. Look at what the father said to him. Look at what, okay, let's begin from what he said to himself, verse 18. Because sometimes what you say to yourself determines what God said to you. <laughs> he said, I will arise and go to my father. And will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. This is the only prayer from a sinner. Eh? If you somebody who lives in sin, don't need to ask God to help him get married. Give me a house. Give me rent. Give me that. No, no, no. You tell God, forgive me my sins. You secure forgiveness first before you ask anything. Do you understand me? That's why I remember somebody, um, <laughs> I don't know how the way people think about me, people I have not met, because the way I respond, me, I don't know how to play games with it. Uh, why should I be? Somebody sent me a text, maybe you watch our brokers on TV, and, uh, and, and he was asking me, um, I should pray. 
concerning this and that, living with a man, all of us also, the man is now going out with another woman. He has not come back home for some days. I should pray that God should bring him home. And I asked, how did you marry him? Of course, how? Did you steal him? Or you picked him on the street? Are you in a marriage or you are in sin? Is he your husband? Did he pay your bride price? Did he take you to church? And the pastor pronounced your husband and wife. If the answer is true, then let me pray. If it's false, come on, leave that thing. You get my point? Leave that thing and go back to your father's house. They didn't respond again. Holy God, no. <laughs> Don't ask me to pray such prayer. If I was a sorcerer, all this money making, I would tell you to bring some. Okay, okay what, how, how old is he? He's 60. Bring 60,000. We are going to arrest him in the spirit. We will travel in the Holy Ghost and carry him from that woman. <laughs> but the truth is that, are you in a marriage? If the foundation be destroyed, the righteous can do nothing. What are you doing there? Did you pick him or he picked you? Who picked each other? <laughs> and how do you arrive in one house? <laughs> so those are, you see, those are things to do because, <laughs> well, <laughs> look at what uh, this man said to God. He said, Father, I have sinned against you. If you don't settle the issue of iniquity, don't approach the throne of God in prayer. I will teach you some things much later. Don't approach the throne of God in prayer. If I hide iniquity in my heart, the Lord shall not hear me. If I live in iniquity, my prayer is abomination to God. If I live in iniquity, my prayer is abomination. That is the truth. So what's the first thing? So this guy said in verse 19, he said, he said and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The, the prodigal son secured the blessing because he prayed right. I am no longer worthy. You see, oh God, even though I don't want to talk high things, it thing comes. <laughs> Let me tell you a mystery. The flow of prayer is according to your spirit nature. Do you hear what I'm saying? The flow of prayer is according to what? Your spirit nature. If your spirit nature is that of a sinner, when you go to God, don't ask him for money. Ask him for mercy. If the spirit nature is sanctified and pure as a son, when you go to God in prayer, you come with boldness. There's a boldness that comes in your spirit. And you know you have been answered before you even pray. Spirit nature. That's how it must be pure. So the first thing God considers when we meet Jesus, his focus. Why we need to know this? I want to take you through a journey. Bring you to the point of having your spirit set for prayer. If, if you come to God and you are not on the same page with God, nothing about God will flow in your life constantly. You hear what I'm saying? When you come to God as a human being through Jesus and you are not on the same page, tell me the same page, with God, there is nothing good that will be flowing from God to your life constantly. It can't come constantly. You always be having break in transmission. Because you're not on the same page. So that is how, as soon as we meet Jesus, the first thing God does to us is to bring us to the same page with him. How? God, I want to show you what God focuses on. When you meet him. So that you also start focusing on the same thing. If you don't focus on what God focuses on, you lose him. In, in our work with God, the word focus is very important. That's a, one of the most important words in the Bible is the word behold. Do you, do you get my point? It's very important. Behold. Whenever you're reading the Bible, you get to the point, behold. You better stop there and meditate. It's calling for alignment, calling for synchronicity, calling for focus. Are you understanding me? So, let's see what God focuses on. The guy now said, make me like one of your hired servants. Do you understand me? And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, remember this was prayer. This is a prayer realm. The prodigal son was in a prayer realm. You get my point? That is prayer. Prayer is communication. I've told you before. Communication with God. So, 
But when he was still a great far off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. This is when the presence falls on you. A father is the presence. Falls on you. Sometimes you're on the floor. Sometimes it happens in church. Sometimes it happens at home. Falls on you. The father has met you. Do you understand me? So look at, look at. I pray that you come to a realm of prayer that the father falls on you, then you start praying. That one is so sweet. When you come to that realm, you don't want to get up. If you are, if you are going to that, the father fall on you and you are praying. Anybody that opened the door and touch you will be an enemy to you. Because they will stop the flow of something. Are you understanding me? So he now went on to say in verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your side. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Write this down. When the presence come on you, when the presence come on you, you only retain it if you respond with the right prayer. When the presence come on you, you only retain it if you respond with the right prayer. The right prayer of a sinner is have mercy on me. That's the right prayer of a sinner. Have mercy on me. So the present came on him. He spoke the right thing. He spoke the right thing. And the Bible says in verse 22, the verse 22 is our point of reference. It says, but the father said to his son, sorry, said to his servant, bring out the best rope and put on him. Question. When the, what took the boy to the father? Problem. It's like you problem took you to, to prayer. So as problem took to God, okay, sorry, not prayer, problem took you to Jesus. Many of us did not give our life to Christ because we, want, we don't want to go to hell. Let's speak the truth. The first time you met, the first time you decided to follow Jesus, how many of you made your decision? I didn't say when you came here. I mean, the first time, maybe 1915, the first, <laughs> the first time you decided to follow Jesus, what was the reason? If you check it, it wasn't because you want to escape hell. You get my point? It wasn't that somebody preached to you and you become convicted. You, so there is hell and you start dropping tears and you jump out and give your life to Christ. But because a problem beat you up <laughs> and you ran. In fact, you came not looking for salvation. You came looking for deliverance. You were not looking for Christ. You were looking for what he can offer. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But, but this guy came like that. The way some, many of us came. He came like that. As soon as he came, what put him was financial hardship. Everything ran down. He now ran to the father. When he came, he now discovered that if, if I only can become a servant of God, Remember, he said he wants to be one of the servants. Is that not? If I, only, if I can only go and open a church, <laughs> I start preaching, I will collect the tithe free. That's how we have robbers on the pulpit. You get my point? If I can only go and open a church, if I can only become a servant in the house, that is an evangelist, that is a preacher. And when God, he came to God, God said, no. My first focus is not to make you a preacher. It's not to make you a servant of God. It's to make you a son. Yeah. Only sons should preach the message of their father. That is why you don't call sons preachers. We are messengers. We receive message from our father and we give to the people he sent us to. So where there is no sonship, foundation for ministry is zero. It could be money. It could be any other thing. It could be fame. You get my point? <laughs> it could be fame. So, so as soon as it came, the father said, wait. Here is my focus. My first focus is to change your life. Remove this garment that he has, you know, the cloth he wore, he was with the pigs. When he was with the pigs, trying to eat with them, who are the pigs? People living in sin. People swimming in sin. Some of you, that's, they were your friends. You were eating with them, relating with them. You go to school with them. You grew up with them. You, 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 you married with them. They were your bridesmaids. If there was no bride, anything, you bride yourself. 
So, all of you were together. You're always on uh, talking to yourself. From once a while, you meet on a cup of coffee, and you take coffee, take some hot stuff, and come out like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fellowshipping with the pigs. You get my point? So he fellowship with the pigs. So when he came, I was praying. The stench he was sending to the nose of the father was not good. The father said, I can't hear you with stench. I love you. I want to change this garment that you got from pigs. All this thing, I hear the stench of pigs, the stench of pigs you have been eating with. I'm hearing it in the spirit. You see, if you understand the mystery of smell in the spirit, it's going to help you as a Christian. The mystery of smell. Stench is a, is a mystery in the kingdom. So, so that was why the father just called the servant. Come. Change his cloth. What is that? Purity. Let's wash him up. Let's purify him. So it means when I meet Jesus, the first focus that God would take, irrespective of what is wrong with me, is my holiness. That's what you want to fix. You want to remove that garment. That was, you know, garment is lifestyle. Do you understand me? The clothes is lifestyle. So your lifestyle that you carve from while you were living in sin, you grew up in sin, your parents never knew Jesus. Some of us, our houses were terrible. Our fathers were peace. Our mothers were peace. Our elder brother was peace. Our junior one was peace. Everybody was a pig. The house was a pig. <laughs> The hustler was a pig. The teacher was a pig. The motorcycle driver was a pig. <laughs> if you climb by the border, a pig is driving it. <laughs> so wherever you went, pig, 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 everywhere. So you became piggy. <laughs> so when you now come to Jesus, he said, I want to make you a sheep. My sheep hear my voice. The voice of a stranger that will not follow. That will not follow. So that was so you must understand the focus of God. When I come to him, he wants to change my garment. Not give me a husband. Not give me a wife. Not give me a job. So actually, people who are making the false prophet rich, they are those who came to God. They don't understand the primary focus. The fear is money, money, marriage. Deliverance from ancestral foundation, evil order, um, what again? <laughs> That's what we fear. We don't know it's a garment thing. If I change my garments, I will carry flies. The stench of the pig is what brings the demons. So as soon as they get, the father said, no, it's the stench. So, he focused on his holiness. So, as soon as I come to Jesus, God focuses on my holiness, on my garment, on my lifestyle. He wants to fix it. He will raise his servant, take the garment of the pig from him. Go and beat him. If you have watched coming to America, the way they beat that prince, that's the way God does in the spirit. He gathered, he beat you completely, remove everything. Some of you, it depends on how you are cooperating. You could be in the bathroom of God for seven years. <laughs> for seven years, you're in the bathroom. Can you imagine being in the bathroom for seven years? You came, he will bet you. Be, while you are there, you are so, oh God, oh, this soap is entering my head. Oh, this soap, oh, oh, this sponge is stupid. <laughs> How many of you have been bet by women in the village <laughs> that you sponge to? Talk to me here. You know, there are certain sponges that are not made in the industry. They are made in the bush. There's one something you pluck. It looks like natural sponge. Oh my God, you guys are born again. <laughs> you, you pluck that thing and soften it. And that your grandmother. Come here, come here. Back at that, back at that, back at that. Your back. <laughs> and <laughs> let's assume you have all those things on the skin. You know it now. In Nigeria, we call it crocro. You have crocro. The guy will crawl you like this. Your grandmother. Why are you? Cha, cha, cha. <laughs> How long do I stay in the bathroom? 
I will stay as long as I don't cooperate. That's what the Bible says. The sacrifice of a broken, the sacrifice of God, a broken heart. A broken and a contrast spirit. You see, people who are submissive don't stay long. People who have the right focus, because here is it. Why we stay long, we came to him. We don't know the focus is to bait us, wear us new clothes, but we think the focus is to give us what we lack. So why he's trying, some of us, we even refuse to go to the bathroom. Why not even enter? <laughs> because you are struggling with him. He, I want to get married. God is saying, no, it's not marriage. He's pulling to the bathroom. He, you are holding like him. He's pulling you. So you guys are, that's how your prayer is. <laughs> because the guy is he's trying to pull you to the bathroom. You, you want to get married. I want to get married. I want to get married. <laughs> like I showed you yesterday, it is your spices that your husband will sense and come. That is why even the baiting is important for your marriage. Because if you send the stench of a pig, your husband will not pick it. A man can pick it and come like this. How are you? <laughs> but your husband will never pick it. Do you get my point? He will never pick it. So this is where the baiting process is important. So tell your neighbor, are you in the bathroom or you are still outside? <laughs> Do you understand what I'm talking about? He needs to pull us in. So, so, so. So, because the Bible says, it says, bring the garment. We all know the father would not have worn him a garment without beating him. So, that is the focus of God. Write this down. As soon as I meet Jesus, the first focus of God is to change my garment. Beat me thoroughly and change my garment. Don't forget that. And the kind of garment is the best rope, not a small one. The best rope. Because... The best robe comes first. Then the next thing that comes is the ring. Covenant. Covenant. God restore back the covenant to you. Do you see in verse 22? He said, bring out the best robe, put it on him, and put a ring on his hands, and sandals on his feet. Three things. The garment first. The ring in your hand. Oh, I wish I could talk about this scripture. I can't. I don't want to go. Because I will have taken it to the book of Zachariah. We are... Zachariah was a priest, and yet, sorry, um, Joshua was a priest, and yet there was a filthy garment in his life. And the devil was standing on that, hindering him. You see, Satan don't have capacity to hinder us. If he's hindering us successful, there's a filthy garment. That's giving him the right to hinder us. To hinder us. I'm speaking out of experience and also out of the scriptures. You get my point? So, 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 because God wants to glorify himself in our lives. But if we don't focus on the proper thing first. So, so he now, he, the, 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 in, in Zechariah 3, the Bible says, God spoke to, the, to, the, to the, uh, those around him. Take away the faith they come in. But it's the same process. It's the same process you go through. How long you stay there determines on your willingness. That is why distraction is very dangerous. Don't be distracted from the real thing. I, I will show you something. So the, the, the garment first, the baiting, the garment, then the ring, then the sandal. What is sandal? Service. Huh? Preparation for the gospel. That is God preparing you for the work he has called you to do. Do you see the process? God does not put you sandal first. Before the garment. You see, if God should bring everybody serving in the church... Apostle, prophet, evangelist, just on the pulpit, just on the pew, all shots, deacon, everybody, and show us their image in the spirit. You will run. You will run away from Kenya. You will see some naked coming like this. Jesus saved. Jesus is coming soon. You will see some very dirty with, with, with a scratch on their body, smiling and moving like this. You will see some Naked from head to toe, but they have sandal. <laughs> they have sandal. You see, a man can wear you sandal. When a man wears you sandal, gives you an assignment, give, ordain you a pastor, why God have not called you, you are a naked person with sandals on your feet. That's how you are in the spirit. But before he wore him sandal, before he responded to divine call, he gave him the robe, gave him the covenant. Gave him the ring. It is that ring 
that talks about communication. I will tell you later. You get my point? Do you see the process? So what is the focus of God for your life and my life when we meet Jesus? Our garment. That's why even when you are preaching, no matter how the level, look at the disciples, they came to Jesus. They said, we cast out demons in your name. He said, fine, fine. Do not rejoice because of that. Rejoice that your name is written. You have the garment. Rejoice. Forget about all this exploit. You're talking about anybody can do exploit, including mosquito. Of course, mosquito does exploit. When the person here, who with your big hand, bah, you slap yourself. You don't laugh. You see, I told you. <laughs> that is exploit. Do you understand me? So exploit is not a monopoly of anybody. Anything can do exploit. Anything can do exploit. You, you, you can, I, I, have, I have seen where uh, such a fly caused a lot of problems in the house. You know such a fly? It flew into the house. Everybody was pursuing it. Kill it, kill it, kill it. Pa, pa. They were jumping on chairs, jumping on TV, jumping. <laughs> and the thing just do like yeah. I went down to the window, but the whole house is scattered. So we exploit. <laughs> so the fact that somebody sing, glory comes, or you do some miracles, God moves you, it, it does not guarantee. The Bible says, rejoice that your name is written. Rejoice that you are doing those things with your garment intact. Because sometimes when God is under pressure, he can use anybody, including a donkey. So the fact that you are being used is not, does not mean he will take you to heaven. Do you understand what I'm talking about? That's why we tremble when God uses us. We, you have to tremble. You have to tremble. Watch this. When I come to Jesus, the focus of God is change his garment. Bait him, change his garment. That, so if I want to be on the same page with God, I must take the same faith position to be on the same page. I should not focus on the things I need, the things that are lost. I should focus on my garment being washed. If you understand this concept, you will not worship in the wrong church because not every church is a washing center. Many are terrible places. So, write this down. The proper faith position to take after meeting Jesus. The proper faith position to take after meeting Jesus is to deal with the unclean in our lives, not look for a miracle. The proper faith position to take after meeting Jesus is to deal with the unclean in our lives and not look for a miracle. Is to deal with the unclean in our lives and not look for a miracle. Say, I hear. I hear. Look at Matthew chapter 12. The danger of looking for a miracle instead of dealing with the unclean in your life. Let me show you the danger in Matthew chapter 12. Look at what Jesus said in verse 43. He said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. You see, the reason why I'm telling this is because it's so sad. That the environment the church finds itself today has flowed into the church. So you now find a wicked and perverse generation in and outside the church. You get my point? We have those in church. We have those outside. But it ought not to be. So look at what the Bible says. When you catch the virus of wicked and perverse generation, you become what we are reading. You will not be interested. Watch this. When you see a Christian who is not interested in his garment... But it's interested in the miracle he wants from God. You have seen somebody who, a, who has been infected by this virus called a crooked and perverse generation. You have seen a crooked and perverse generation in church. So look at what Jesus says. Remember, he was talking to people that are religious people. He said, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he said, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept. He finds it empty. Swept and put in order. Listen, mark the words. Mark this word. Say me empty. empty. Say swept. swept. Say me put in order. No. Did he say clean? No. Hello? No. Wait, 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 wait. People that we are raised by house herbs, people that while you were born, your mother had a house hair. 
you grow up, you have your own house help. Your child is not growing up, you have given your child house help. So you've passed the house help from generation to generation. You will not understand the mystery of the scripture. If you were the house help in your mother's house, you, the children, you join in sweeping the house. Join in cleaning the house, you understand the scripture. You can sweep a house without cleaning it. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can sweep a house without cleaning the house. A house can be swept. Look at the next word. Look at, look at, look at those words. It says empty. Say me empty. Yeah. Swept. Say swept. And put in order. You can arrange the seats in a house. You can sweep it. You can put it in order. And yes, the, the house is not clean. Hmm? For instance, you enter the house. It's smelling. The seat they put in order, there was poo on it. But you put it in order. A child drops something. Mm. And yet, but you just arrange the chair. Put it in order. And on the television, I stand like this. <laughs> the house is in order, but it's not clean. The curtains. Ooh, that is your towel. That's how you go to clean your hand. In your curtain. Some of you, that is the ministry. You have. <laughs> and when you finish eating, you go at home, Masaka Poshetel. <laughs> Cleaning up the curtain of your house. <laughs> so the curtain is there. Okay? What you use in sleeping, it has not been. The last time you washed it was 1965. <laughs> I mean, your blanket. The blanket you wrap like this, like the massage. You stand like this. You know, there's cold. Apostle said we should pray, so we have to pray. You wrap it like this. That thing has, since you came to Christ, the last time you washed it was the day you, you, you joined the first church in your life. You now came to Christ, the spirit, the thing is still there. You have not washed it. So why you are wrapping in my capacity? The thing is dirty. Dropping things in your body. So a place can be kept in order. A place can be swept, empty, kept in order, but not clean. Do you understand me? Look at what the Bible says. He said, then he goes and takes with himself, how many? Seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they entered and dwelt there. What will bring the unclean spirit back is because the house has been swept, empty, kept in order, but it is unclean. No unclean spirit stays in a clean house. When I say house, I'm referring to our lives. Holiness is the greatest force you can use to cast out demons. If you want to expel demons out of your life, live a holy life. Simple. It, I didn't say pray 24 hours a day. I said live a holy life. Live a holy life. You see all these Christians who do prayer chain. That's how they are chained. I'm not against prayer chains, sir. But the ones who do it today, <laughs> crazy. Listen carefully. Look at verse 45. Where do we stop? That himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is what? It's worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. Reverse back. What's the definition? Verse 39. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seek afterward a sign. I stop there. So when I come to Jesus and I'm seeking after miracles that he must do in my life, instead of me seeking after changing my garment, if my priorities are not right, I suffer whatever we read from verse 43. There's something called you become a resting place of demons. Do you know why we have deliverance cases in the church today? Because we don't prioritize the right thing. So, if you look at the church today, listen, listen to, to, to uh, media houses, listen to preaching of preachers. It's, it's just about deliverance. Evil altar, evil foundation, late marriage, early marriage, no pregnancy, multiple pregnancies, spirit of rejection, spirit of delay, spirit of eating too much, spirit of cutting short while you're eating, spirit of sleeping in the midst of eating. 
So we have manufactured everything. So you know why? Because many came to Christ, but the focus was not the garment. The focus was what they want God to do in their lives. The miracle they want. So the Bible says the house was swept, kept in order, kept empty, and the unclean spirit came back. You see, what I'm trying to tell us is this. If we come into Christ and we don't focus on dealing with the unclean, do you, do you understand me? Dealing with the unclean, because that is the focus of God. I want to deal with the unclean. I wish I can, I can demonstrate it. But let me use my words to explain something to us. Picture a young woman with a basket on her head. Why she's walking on the street. Picture her walking on the street, let's say from the beginning of, uh, of Kimati Street to the end. And there are about 24 men. Okay, not 24. Yeah, 24 men by the roadside. Each one with a content to drop in her basket. So while she's passing, this one drop his own. While she's passing, this one drop his own. By the time she gets to the end, she has received 24 things in her basket. Picture the basket to be the spirit of man, to be your spirit. Picture the young girl to be you and I. Picture the men that stand on the street dropping things to the things we absorb from the society. They drop them on our lives as you grow. Maybe one year, they drop two years, they drop three years, they drop maybe your nanny carrying you, drop her own field in your life. Your, your mother who is not born again, drop her own feet. If you were born out of wedlock and her anger that the man gave her, gave you to her belly and disappeared, she pounded it on you. When you're only six years, she's pushing you into men to sleep with you. They are dropping things. When you meet Jesus, look at what he would do. Bring your basket. I want to remove everything. And you say, no, Lord, don't remove. Give me a husband. No, 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 no. I have to remove the things in your basket. Do you hear what I'm saying? I have to remove these things out of your life. So if you don't take that as your focus, dealing with the unclean, all those things are unclean things in your life. So you have to deal, you have to focus on God dealing with the unclean. If you don't sift and start asking for his miracle, for you to meet this need, you leave a vacuum for anything he removed at salvation to return back sevenfold. That's how you see today. We have worse sinners in church. You can't believe this. The sinners we have in church, they are worse than the ones outside. Honestly, you know why? The ones outside still fear God. The ones inside, they are used to God. In fact, to them, God understands. <laughs> and I'm born again, I'm spirit filled. Uh, one safe, forever safe. And uh, nothing can separate me for the love of God. Oh, yeah, let's continue. Hmm. You, you get my point? If we don't get our priority right, then we cannot go forward. Write this point down. The unclean you do not deal with will deal with you by polluting the clean oil of God's grace in your life. The unclean you do not deal with will deal with you by polluting the clean oil of God's grace in your life. The unclean you do not deal with will deal with you by polluting the clean oil of God's grace in your life. The clean oil of God. Tell me oil of God's grace. Say again, oil of God's grace. Now, listen. When we meet Jesus by encounter, he drops the oil of his grace upon us. That grace is called saving grace. Tell me saving grace. Say again, saving grace. Add more life to that. Say saving grace. So when God put that oil in our lives, the day we encounter Jesus, we have a responsibility to deal with the unclean. The unclean things that we have absorbed in life. Because the oil rests in our spirit, not in our soul. The soul is always the carrier of the unclean things. You get my point? Because that is where the five faculties are. Memory, imagination, emotions and everything. Intelligence. Now, now, now we, we have to protect the oil in our spirit by making sure the unclean in the soul is dealt with. 
Do you understand me? If we don't deal with it, it will pollute the sanctity of the oil in our soul. I was still connected to prayer. Listen to me carefully. It will pollute the sanctity of the oil in our soul. And if you look at Titus, let me run through some scriptures that will show us about things about the oil of grace. Titus chapter 3, it confirms or it explains these things further. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. Look at what the Bible says. For we ourselves, we also want, we were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lust and pleasure. Do you see the things that the field of life, when they enter you, you begin to operate like this. Living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior towards man appeared, not by works of righteousness. That means we didn't do anything to be saved. Jesus did everything to save us. We are to do everything to retain the salvation. Do you understand my point? A gift you don't receive and retain, you will lose it. Salvation is free. You freely receive but costly retain. Do you hear what I'm saying? You freely receive that word, costly return. He said, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That means I, I, I don't do anything to be saved. He saved me by grace. But I do everything after I am saved to retain what he has given me. Is everybody hearing me? If you are hearing me in this, I'll lift up your hand. Everyone in the house, lift up your hand. Good. Hallelujah to Jesus. He now said, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? Through the washing of what? Regeneration. A renewing of the Holy Spirit. Say me oil of grace. That is the way it works. There are three or four times the Holy Ghost enters a man. The first time is when you meet Jesus. He enters 30%, 30-fold. 30-fold. He, he comes into your spirit. So this is, that is what we call the saving grace. Do you understand me? So, so this saving grace regenerates the spirit. It regenerates the spirit, the human spirit. When that has happened, it becomes the oil of God's grace in your spirit. Now, your job is to make sure all the unclean things you gathered in your life that are now settling in the soul, you deal with it. Or else they will flow back to the spirit and pollute the oil and you lose your salvation. Do you understand me? Let's go forward. Look at verse 6. He said, when he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become what? Hence, according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying. And these things I wanted to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain what? Good works. Do you see it? Maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. So we men how do you maintain good works? What has happened in your spirit should flow to the soul and flow to the body. And change your life. Those are the good works. That's how to maintain it. So whatever will not allow that progression to take place, you deal with it. You deal with it. Whatever will not let it, you deal with it. Be it a friend, you deal with it. You cut up from the friend. Whatever will not let that happen. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So, so, let me show you another scripture. Romans chapter 12. That tells us that we must guard or protect the oil of God's grace in our life. Tell your neighbor, it's your responsibility to protect the oil of grace in your life. Say again, it's your responsibility to protect the oil of God's saving grace in your life. Look at Romans chapter 12. That's why you are the priest. The first priest of your life, you are. Romans 12 verse 9. Look at what it says. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Look at the next statement. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Say, I hear. Abhor what is evil. Cling. That is how to keep the oil pure. That's how to deal with the unclean things in life. Abhor what is evil. Here's the point. When, when, you, when, when it comes in, when God comes into the soul, the spirit, with the oil of grace, it flows and begins to eliminate every field in your soul. 
it begins to eliminate. Now, the way you relate with God determines if the elimination will continue or not. Do you understand me? Now, if you relate with God properly, the elimination will continue and completely wipe it away. So, look at what is happening to some people. When the glory of God is trying to eliminate you, you are bringing more. The Bible says, abhor what is evil. Do not expose yourself to what is evil. Let God finish the one within first. And end it. Don't bring another thing inside. You get my point? The unclean, you have gathered all your life. Let God deal with it. Don't add more. Look at sexual sin, for example. Each sexual act registers something in the soul. That takes years to bring out. To el eliminate. Each sexual act. It registers something in the soul that takes years. In fact, sometimes it doesn't even come out. God will just give you multiple encounters you feel yourself with revelation and it like silence that aspect of life this is why that sin is very dangerous are you understanding me things that happen in life they just get registered in the soul and god is saying my job is to eliminate those fields that are dwelling in you do not bring more by exposing yourself that's why you hear people like job said i made a covenant with my eyes why should i behold a maid why is it like i am married and i'm looking at a single girl why why should i do that do you understand me? I have to protect my house so that the unclean that has been removed will not return. Because when it returns, it comes with seven. It comes with seven. They will not clean. Above what is evil. Look at verse 10. It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Say, I hear I pray that we adjust, align ourselves to this scripture, giving preference to one another. I, it, it, that brings mutual respect. You, you prefer this person more than that means it's like saying, oh, I want to sit down, you get up, no, you sit. You get my point? We are serving food. Oh, oh okay, serve them first. Give preference to others. That's what the Bible is saying. They are sharing something. Oh, give them first. You don't rush. Hey, 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 and push. Ah. In the same church, it, doesn't, it should not happen that way. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Look at the next word, verse 11. Not lagging in diligence. You see, God is against laziness. Fervent in spirit. Hallelujah. I will hit this later. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. If you are not fervent in spirit, what is in your spirit cannot eliminate the field in your soul. You have to be fervent, hot in the Holy Ghost. Be so hot that you burn your clothes. <laughs> I mean that in a spiritual sense. When your clothes are burnt with the glory of God, when the sick touch it, they'll be healed. Why did that man, that woman say she wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment? The fire in Jesus burnt everything, including his clothes. The clothes were flaming. And the woman touched it and was healed. The Bible says we should be fervent in spirit. You see, it is fervency in spirit that when you are praying, you pray very well. If you are not fervent when you are praying, Father, thank you for... Thank you for coming. Bless your name. Every demon in this place. In the name of Jesus. We ask you, just come out. Just, no, no, no. You see, don't waste your time. Just come out, eh? You know, you ought not to be this place. You just walk out. <coughs> oh, God. I didn't wear my shoe very well. I'm so good. You are just your weak. And thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Yes, great is your faithfulness. Okay. Uh, great is your faithfulness in everything. You are a corpse. <laughs> Fevency in spirit. In the name of Jesus, every demonic spirit, we come and lose your hold. In the name of Jesus, every works of the enemy, you can't succeed around me. In the name of Jesus. Fevency. We were only four in 1992. Only four of us. We prayed with fevency. The whole neighborhood gathered around us. The Holy Ghost descended on everyone. They were on the floor. I don't know why he kept me standing. Fevency. God is a man of war. Fevency in spirit. It keeps what has happened in your spirit flowing to your soul. You can delete loss through fevency. You can delete pride through fervency in spirit. You can delete the thing resting in your spirit through fervency. Do you know that if you are fervent, the devil will be careful about your life. 
He will say, touch not. Do not go. Instead of God telling him, touch not, he will tell his, uh, 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 his demons, touch not. Because this one, if you touch her, we are going to suffer. He will get up. Even though they are sleeping, you touch him, you go to, Lake up a set, Lake I have a cut. Where are they? But you, when you are praying, Father, thank you. Oh, bless. You. But when somebody insults you, me? Nonsense! Is it me you're talking to? I will slap you! You are fevered in the flesh, not in spirit. You will quarrel, maybe in a matter to somebody match your feet like this. I'm sorry. Sorry what? Sorry what? What told you? This is the shoe I bought. I bought this shoe last week. It's a new shoe that I bought. I am touching it. I said, I am sorry. I said, what? You stupid. You will forget you are born again. You are fervent in quarrel. Some wives are fervent when they face their husband. They come like this. <laughs> they come like this. Be when they are praying. That's a girl. If it's my father and the Lord, you are doing that thing. Ah, he will call like this. Bah! Slap the demon out of you. Ah, ah. But if you want to quarrel, prevent. You stupid. You crazy. You, you get my point. But look at how the Bible wants us. We should be fervent in spirit, but gentle when we are provoked. That's why you have power. Do you understand me? Fever. Tell me fervency. That was what Elijah had. That's what they called the prophet of fire. It was fervency. If I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. Fervency. Are you understanding me? So, the Bible went on to say, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Do you see the things that help us to progress? It has what has happened in your spirit to progress to your soul. It's a fever in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, not panicking in tribulation. Say with me, patience. No panic. You see, when you are panicking, hey, pray for me, hey, pray for me. You are panicking. He said, patient, be still, and you will know I am God. Patient in tribulation. Because tribulation works the approved character in our lives. A char- there must be an approved character for any blessing you want from God. Is somebody hearing from God this morning? Look at the next thing. He said, he said, continue, continuing steadfastly. How? In prayer. Do you see how what happens in the spirit connects prayer? So if you don't live the right light, the right life, you cannot have the prayer spirit. You cannot operate in the prayer spirit if you don't live the right life. So this, what God does in our spirit moves in our soul. If we follow the things we have just read, are you understanding what I'm talking about? So you see how abhorring what is evil, clinging to what is good, being affectionate and kind, I mean being fevered in spirit, diligence, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, passion in tribulation, contrast this thing, gives to the fire to continue steadfastly in prayer. Steadfastly in prayer. Are you understanding me? The Lord began to show me that when we have the prayer spirit, even adversity cannot quench it. In fact, adversity will fuel it. So we will not have issues of, oh, I can't pray because I, I, I missed that. I went for an interview, I failed, so I can't pray. You become depressed. You get my point? The prayer spirit does not give room for depression. In fact, the attack of the devil kindles it. You get my point? You, you, you see that you have just 15 days to go. You have not gathered money to pay your rent. You don't wait until, that, until the landlord starts sending the message. Become fervent. That should keep you in prayer. You get my point? Fervent. Continuously. Before you hit there, your money will come. Continuously. The prosperity of the righteous is cooked on the prayer knee, my friend. Do you understand? He said, he said we continue, God wants us to continue. Stage. That's why he said in the book of Luke chapter 18, men always ought to pray in disappointment. Pray. When things are wrong, pray. When things are right, pray. You see us, things are wrong, we pray. Things are right, we don't. Things are right, we don't. When things are wrong, we pray. That is a bad Christianity. He said, pray without season. 
Do you understand what I'm talking about? So, the unclean, we do not deal with, will deal with us by polluting the oil of grace. Do you understand me? When the oil of grace is not polluted, we can pray continuously and steadfastly. In another word, the oil of grace is the fuel of the prayer spirit. That's why we must keep it pure by dealing with the unclean. Do you understand me? By the, the Bible says, stand therefore in the liberty which Christ has set you free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Do not go back to sin. Why? To protect the oil. You see, the church don't have the revelation of what they lose when, they, when we sin. Let's say we have the revelation of what we lose when we sin. You will not persuade anybody not to sin. Because when you know the cost, you will keep your body under. But look at what the devil does to us. The devil brings the pleasure. He, he brings the revelation of the pleasure of sin to us. And we are enticed by it. Look at what he did to Eve. He said, has God really said? And I said, oh, but you know, when she responded, I said, no, you shall not really die. He was advertising the power of the act. The pleasure of the act. That is why you see the Bible says Moses forsake the pleasure of Egypt. If you don't know how to forsake the pleasure of sin, you will live in sin. The pleasure of sin is deceitful. It seeks the satisfaction of the flesh. It's deceitful. Sin is very costly to a child of God. Somebody who is not saved doesn't have problem with sin because he's already dead. He can be committing sin and be committing no problem. If you not see the person, he may be singing in the choir or preaching on the pulpit, but he's not safe. You not say, why is it that this Christian is doing it? Let me also do it. You are not the same. You, you are alive. He is dead. It will be very costly. Okay, watch this. Was it only Samson that slept with a woman called Delilah? Sorry, visited Delilah's house. They were, I'm sure there were other Delilahs. In fact, okay, let me not say so. Men have been coming to Delilah's house. Haven't they been coming? But has anyone lose his eyes? They come in and do whatever and go. Delilah will be back. <laughs> and I will come in and do and go. Delilah will be back. And Samson now says, okay, let me also go to Delilah. <laughs> Samson, you forget that you're a Nazarene. You forget that you're a son of God. You forget that sin destroys you more than the lost because they're already lost. But he went there. Samson was the only man that visited Delilah's house and lost his eyes. Why? Because of who he is. Be careful of whose son you are. Be aware of whose son you are. There are things you should do. Don't walk the way others are walking because you don't have the same father. You see, you could be bearing the same son name. Do you hear what I just said? You could be bearing the same son name in that house. Maybe it's your mother that carried all of you in her tummy and brought you people out. But when you switch base in the spirit and you become born again, you don't have the same father again. Jesus made it clear to us when he told the religious people, you are of your father the devil. So when you operate with people, check whose father they are. You just check. Do you understand me? So you don't follow what they are, the, what they are following because it will be very costly on your part. So the oil of grace will be polluted. Once it is polluted, you can no longer pray steadfastly. A Christian who does not pray steadfastly will suffer spiritual attack consistently. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you cannot pray steadfastly, you suffer co attacks consistently. You have to come to the point. In the bathroom, you are praying. While you are eating, you are praying. In the bus, you are praying. You maintain the prayer spirit. Let me tell you what the prayer spirit is. It's like putting your phone on to receive calls whenever they die. Do you hear me? Because if your phone is on, wherever I dial anywhere in the world, you receive the call. But when it is off, you can't. So the prayer spirit is like that phone. You keep your life on. When God sends a call, you pick. When he sends a mail, you pick. When he sends anything, you pick. You understand the mess of Jehovah. You could be in the bathroom and God wants to give you an email. He wants to send an email. He just send it. It came. He da you download it immediately in your spirit. And you go and put things down. That is the prayer spirit. It's our phone. Phone. If our com is our communication gadget in the realm of the spirit. If you understand me, say I hear. I hear. But all these things can only function when the oil of grace within is not polluted. 
You cannot tell why you come to church. Prayer is going on fervently. Some are also looking fervently. When service closed, they can tell you how everybody prayed. This one stood up. This one stand up. Who made you a spectator? You don't spectate in church. You participate. You participate. It's in the football field they spectate. If the players start looking at themselves, can they play? You get my point? Like one funny story that we were told one time about football. That some African team, I don't know which country, I don't know why they were just forging it, went to play in the white man's country. And they met the World Footballer of the Year. That, and that World Footballer of the Year belonged to the other team. So while they were playing, they, some of them stopped. They were watching the World Footballer of the Year. They looked at him, And they were clapping for him. In the field. <laughs> They, they were clapping. When the guy took the ball and went and scored, they, they, he scored them. They joined in clapping. <laughs> because they were spectators. Instead of participators, a participator will stop him. That's why it is in the realm of the spirit. When it comes to the, the kingdom of God, there's no spectator. We are all fighters. We are all soldiers. We are all battle men and women. You get my point? There's no room to watch the other person. Ah, the way he pray, the way he fast, the way he sing. No, 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 no. If you are watching, you are not yet part of the family. When I say family, I'm not referring to a denomination. You are not part of the kingdom. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So if you don't protect the oil of grace in, in your life, you cannot be fevered in prayer. So at this point, I want to tell you what you need to know about the prayer spirit. Number one, write it down if you can. The prayer spirit is the divine ability to lift up your voice in prayer to your heavenly father at all times, in all seasons. The divine ability to lift up your voice in prayer to your heavenly father at all times, in all seasons. Hallelujah. That's the prayer spirit. It is the divine ability to lift up your voice in prayer to your heavenly father at all times. In all seasons. We're supposed to be trees that bring forth their fruit in every season. When things are okay, you are there. When they are not okay, you are there. In the night season, weeping may enjoy for a night, you are praying. Joy comes in the morning, you are praying. In the days of joy, you are praying. God bless you with good money. You are going to give God any sacrifice, you are praying. He bless you with good money. You are going to buy a good car, you are praying. Not that the day you go and buy the car, you'll be so happy that you forget your money devotion. In fact, that day you will not go to Facebook to read the devotional. <laughs> because the joy of going to buy a car has eaten you up like a plague. Very soon you will lose it. Because you don't have stature to keep it. Are you understand what I'm talking about? So the prayer spirit is the divine ability. Some divine ability. Some people, it's not even a common text message to come for interview. The person have looked for a job for 47 years. Common text message to come for interview will make him to forget to pray. And when he gets there, he will sit down, wait for three extra hours. That is supposed to have prayed at home. If you don't know how to pray in all seasons, you become a captive in the pocket of the devil. At all seasons. But we cannot until we have the prayer spirit. So that very ability, say me ability. This, that divine ability to lift up your voice in prayer to your heavenly father at all times, in all seasons. When you are sick, you pray. When you are going through anything, you lift up your voice. When you are not going through anything, lift up your voice. If you are okay, pray. That ability is what we call the prayer spirit. Look at Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 17. Look at what the Bible says. It says, the righteous cry out. Hallelujah. The righteous cry out. And the Lord hears. And deliver them out of all their trouble. The righteous cry. The righteous. May God begin to hear your cry. In the name of Jesus Christ. That is the prayer spirit. Ability to send a cry to the throne room. 
You got my point. I thought I would be able to talk about the authority of the believer today, but maybe I'll do that next week if God permit. You send your cry. You send your cry in the spirit. The Bible said the righteous cry out, not the wicked. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. 